Hello everyone, I'm Paris Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox, hosted by Richard Lummis. Hello and welcome to another episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast about leadership. This is Richard Lummis, I'm here with Tom Fox for another discussion on how to improve our leadership skills. We believe leadership is a skill which can be improved with study of both good and bad practices, and we try to draw interesting examples from many sources, including history, fiction, film, and business writing. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Richard. Today we're going to begin a new series of podcasts where we discuss, instead of pure leadership, uh, economic disasters, financial panics, and market bubbles. We're going to start with four podcasts on some of the most famous of these occurrences. Chronologically, we're going to start with the Dutch tulip bubble of the 1630s. We'll then move on to the roughly contemporaneous South Sea bubble and the Mississippi Company, and finish with the panic of 1907 in the United States. Inspiration for these discussions was in one of the great courses series of lectures, Crashes and Crisis, Lessons from a History of Financial Disasters by Professor Connell Pullenkamp of Duke University. Beginning with the tulip bubble, uh, Pullenkamp cautions that much of what we think we know may be based more on folklore and morality tales than on actual fact. In the case of the Dutch tulip bubble, more recent economic research has brought a great deal of new information to light, especially on prices. I also often forget the Dutch were among the earliest pioneers of joint stock companies and financial markets, including both stock markets and futures or options markets. Tom, where would you like to begin today's discussion? Richard, I think uh, maybe going through a little bit of the history uh, would be helpful. Uh, And there are uh, really lots of lessons uh, to be learned. I suppose I should start by saying I had as much fun uh, preparing for these series of podcasts as any I think that uh, we've done. Uh, Professor Fullenkamp uh, has a wonderful lecture series on the great courses, but we were able to find uh, some really interesting primary and secondary materials uh, that go into went into our research. I was frankly stunned to find that not only does the Federal Reserve Board uh, allow uh, a commentary by its members uh, in public forums, but also put in put out educational materials in forms of teaching guides for high school students. Which are quite comprehensive. They were very comprehensive, so much so that they were one of the resources uh, that we used in in a later podcast. So uh, lots of good material on these, but uh, your point that uh, recent scholarship or recent research has uh, perhaps um, challenged some of the myths of these great uh, financial disasters, I think is uh, absolutely on point. Uh, the, The overriding theme for me from these four podcasts, and I would certainly like to get your thoughts was that um, much of what we learned I have found to be way too facile and that they look for one event, one person, one bad intention, uh, one nefarious actor that caused something. And it's never that. It's a series of steps. Some may have been caused by ill intent. Some may have been criminal acts. Nevertheless, it's always a series of steps um, which lead to uh, a financial disaster. And for TULIPs, uh, although we could start with the importation uh, of tulips t- into Holland from Turkey, I would perhaps point to a little bit later uh, in the early part of the 1600s where the then smart set, uh, as we would call them now, then royalty and aristocracy, began wearing uh, flowers in um, dresses, women. Yep. And uh, I, I thought, well, gosh, how odd is that? And then I realized, you know, I've, I've been to a high school and college homecoming where women (laughs) wore moms. So, you know, women still do wear flowers. So that's certainly uh, was an unfair uh, initial reaction by me. Nevertheless, it was this fashion um, statement that led to the initial increase in price of tulips because tulips were one of the more more worn flowers, certainly in uh, Holland, but really across that swath of uh, Northern Europe. And the... um, um, from there, though, uh, there was a couple of things that really struck me that came into play here. Um, <clears throat> first is uh, Professor Fullenkamp started off his uh, uh, series by defining an asset price bubble as an upward departure of an asset's price from a reasonable level. And he really made you think about what is a reasonable level? Well, unless you're in a socialist state or a communist state, um, it's it's the market, it's the invisible yeah. hand that determines what is reasonable. So it's always going to be porous. It's always going to be amorphous. And he had a a fabulous uh, definition of what he called current price. Uh, 
which he defined as the reasonable price, or also used the term fundamental price, plus a bubble price. And there are two separate components. And I found uh, dislinking those concepts really helped me understand uh, particularly the tulip bubble, um, but also some of the uh, other bubbles that we will we'll talk about in this podcast series. Uh, the other thing that you also highlighted was the um, uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch and uh, um, Netherlands um, creation of the stock market. And uh, one of our later podcasts, we focus on a fascinating gentleman named John Law, who actually studied in Amsterdam yeah. as part of his uh, financial education. Um, but the Dutch were uh, really uh, on the forefront, uh, even more than the um, the Italians from the Renaissance, who were, uh, I think, more bankers than uh, financial engineers. We can <laughs> use that term, <laughs> Specu- <laughs> speculators. Uh, and um, so I found uh, that. And then the next really thing uh, was another theme that we see uh, throughout this uh, series of podcasts. And that's the price you had to pay and uh, to get the product or get the future, I should say. Um, the Dutch did have a stock market. They banned futures futures or options unless you actually own the physical good. Well, uh, that's antithetical to futures trading. So the market moved into what uh, Fullenkamp called colleges, uh, but they were really just groups of traders in taverns. Yeah, in bars. In, in bars. <laughs> Drinking heavily. Drinking heavily. Not that that's not a bad place to conduct business. We may have done that once or twice. Nevertheless, um, it's probably not conducive to rational trading. So you have groups of traders who would meet in taverns uh, and uh, to trade these uh, tulip futures or options, that we would now call them, they did not have to put uh, much money down. In fact, it was 2.5% of the total cost was all they had to put down. So whether you want to later call that a margin, whatever you, uh, uh, putting something down, the the concept of not having to pay for a future can lead to huge speculation. And that we saw that in this case. From there, we went to, um, because these futures contracts, uh, the owners did not own the physical good, the tulip bulb, they were not legal either. So that meant they were not legally enforceable. That actually has uh, quite a bit of um, uh, uh, play in all of this because uh, there there could be no legal consequences to putting your 2.5% down and buying a uh, future in a tulip bulb. So uh, neither uh, the price was very low. There were no legal consequences and it was all uh, accomplished on the margins of Dutch economic life, not in the, the stock exchange. Um, I'd, I'd like to break in and, okay. and point out a couple of other things because the folklore aspect is really interesting here. What you always hear about are the bulbs that sold for the price of a great townhouse in Amsterdam. Right. And that was actually a very small part of the market that was not usually subject to the futures trades. And... When you look at the amount of wealth that was flowing into the Netherlands at that time, it seems to me that what was driving that market far more resembled, say, the market for Impressionist paintings in the 1990s in America. They were a prestige good, and the more you paid for it, the more prestige you got for it. And if you look at it, the price of those bulbs actually rose quite steadily over a period of about eight years. Right. And the actual mania was in the cheaper bulbs and only lasted a few months. Uh, Exactly. And... and I, I was somewhat surprised at, to follow the logical end of where you're going, I thought, with this, which was the actual impact of the Dutch economy was negligible. Yeah. And that, that was quite a surprise for me because I thought this was the first great bubble in history. Uh, an entire civilization, if not, you know, the people of the Netherlands were destroyed by this. But it turned out not to be true. But it, it really set up for me, I think, a model to, to understand um, how... Uh, these uh, types of economic bubbles can occur and and what drives them. So we had these get-rich-quick schemes uh, explode literally as the prices, uh, first uh, prices spiked, of course, then went into the stratosphere, and then um, they dropped significantly. So um, we had uh, an unregulated market with people who had to put almost no skin in the game, and as a lawyer, I'm always concerned about the legal consequences of your action. 
Um, but here there were relatively no legal consequences. So it didn't cost anyone to, uh, to really engage in this. And this story, uh, at least my research, hasn't turned up any individual names of participants or leaders in this effort. Uh, we will see that in later podcasts and later bubbles. Um, perhaps that's because of the, the lack of written records from this time period. Perhaps it's because of the, the nature of trading in a bar or in a college, uh, even if it's worse, in a college, uh, if that college happens to be located in a tavern uh, by people who are flipping these uh, contracts. Uh, the other thing that struck me uh, was you rarely have bubbles over goods that can be use, used, and that's what tulip bulbs are. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a mining stock. It's, it's not... Um, uh, trying to corner the market in something that we see in, in later scandals, but it's actually a physical good. And so um, by not by dislinking the ownership of the physical good with the ability to trade on a futures market, I think set up uh, a disaster. But having now read all of this, having listened to uh, the Great Courses lecture by Professor Fullenkamp, uh, I'm not sure this was the unmitigated financial disaster that I had uh, previously thought. I agree. I, I, that was my understanding as well, that it had been a disaster. <clears throat> People went bankrupt and so forth. But the fact that the contracts were not legally enforceable <coughs> excuse me, made a huge difference. Basically what happened is everybody sort of sobered up in the spring of uh, 1637. Um, and I guess the other aspect is the actual trade in tulip bulbs can only exist for about three months of the year in the summer. Right, because that's when they can be dug out of the ground and, and literally handed over. So this this giant bubble occurred during the winter when there was no physical good to be transferred, and so as I said, when they sobered up in the early spring of uh, 1637, basically everybody just sort of said, "Oh wow, what were we thinking?" Uh, settled the contracts for pennies on the dollar, and everybody went home. So uh, at least for my part of this, Richard, I'd like to end with uh, these words from Professor. Fullenkamp, he said that weak punishments make for strong incentives to take excessive financial risks throughout history. And the tulip bubble is a great example of what happens when people who participate in financial markets aren't required to have enough skin in, in the game. And I think that uh, financial risks, assessment of risk, studying of risk, forecasting of risk, management of risk is one of the key uh, themes throughout business, uh, certainly in our lifetime, probably long before that. But if you have a dislinked punishment uh, for taking excessive risks, uh, perhaps the biggest lesson out of the tulip bubbles uh, is that people will take those risks. Yeah. Well, and the risk doesn't have to just be financial. The um, And some of the things, some of the cases we'll see, the the people involved were subsequently threatened with arrest and imprisonment and so forth. Um, that seems to have unfortunately gone away in the U.S. system, but uh, I think we'll... <laughs> we, you we, wouldn't we, be talking about anything like 208, would you? We may see it return. We may see it return. Anyway, I think that's a great summary. Um, this, this one does not involve some of the other themes, such as government intervention to a great extent, although it, it sort of did in that uh, what really cracked the market was when the government... Uh, was taking steps to make the contracts enforceable. Right. So um, so on that note, there's several really fun books about it um, and, and a lot of really good articles. Uh, I recommend those, The um, and I highly recommend the Full and Camp series in, in total. For now, this is Richard Lummis and Tom Fox with 12 O'Clock High. We hope you'll listen in next time. This is Paris Fox again. We hope you enjoyed this episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and rate the podcast. Thank you for listening. 